Mm. So could, perhaps we could start with you, Sue, and just tell us a bit, uh, tell us a little bit more about your story and how, and then we'll get on to Anne. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I never know where to start. Probably the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Well, the beginning for this type of thing. But um, I'd escaped an abusive home life and went into the care of the state. Uh, they sent me back to Nudgee Orphanage thinking that I'd, because I'd been there as a small child, that I'd be happier there. I, went, I was there for about three or four weeks and the nuns thought that I was retarded. They sent me to Lowson House, which is at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, to an adult mental health, uh, locked mental health ward for assessment. I was supposed to be there for eight weeks. Um, within three weeks, the uh, treatment team, including Dr Van Hees, Professor Whitlock, who was a psychologist at the time, said there was no underlying psychiatric condition. This child has been displaced here and must be removed immediately. Well, nobody came to get me. Mm. And then Children's Services said that I was a catch-22. Uh, didn't make any sense to a 12-year-old. <laughs> um, so nobody wanted me because I'd been into a mental institution. And then my behaviour deteriorated over time. I wasn't a, I was, wasn't a delinquent to start with. Um, but I rebelled and I'd fight and uh, became very medicated. Lots of bad things happened. Isolation cells uh, for long periods of time sort of strips you um, your identity, yeah, you, you, uh, who you are inside. And then by the time I was 13, 13 and a half, they thought I should go to my peers and I was sent to Wilson Detention Centre. But I hadn't committed a crime, I didn't go through a court or any other process. And then they thought I was too hard to handle because I was spending more and more time in isolation that they sent me back to Lowson House. And Lowson House said that I'd been there for too long and they sent me on to Walsham Park, which is Goodna. And I was sent straight to Osler House. For the, um, most of the women there were there from the prisons. Mm. Um, and then I spent eight years there and I had a child. I was a, uh, I've since found him. He was adopted out. And then when he was 23, I found him, and we've been very close ever since. I managed to have four other daughters and helped raise a few other kids in my day. <laughs> uh, I did try studying, and I've worked whenever I could. Now, I, um, after reconciliation last year, people may remember, there was a reconciliation process between the health department and the survivors, and we won that. But I think in all of my time, because um, I've been reflecting, looking, looking forward to coming to see, meet everyone today, and I thought, now what can I talk about? Because Anne is just so amazing. <laughs> but I thought how I, how I could um, introduce that part of the history was in amongst the fight, there was people like Karen Walsh, who she's from MICA Projects, Professor Ben Matthews from the um, QUT, QET, QUT, Law uh, University, and lots of other academics and media people, and then there's um, our old Mental Health Royal Commissioner, and there's so many different people, academics, people from all over walks of life, all banded together with a passion to make things change, and to, you know, and to also fight for justice for us, like Father Wally, and he's been along, he knows all of us. <laughs> and so what happened in the end was there was, I think there was just so much weight, and we weren't going away. We kept it going for like 20, 25 years. Um, but then I met Anne, 2012 was it Anne? Mm. Anne contacted me and asked if I'd um, be willing to let her paint me for the Archibald Prize. Now I, to be honest, I hadn't really heard about the Archibald Prize. Good. I do know that it comes in the paper every year. But then when I looked into it, I thought, wow, what an honour. You know? And so I was excited. And then I met Anne. I'm, Changed myself about four times that day, Cindy, oh. the, because I thought, what am I going to wear? I'm going to get painted. <laughs> and I was expecting Anne to turn up with a big, yeah. do a painting. Oh, whoops. Yeah, yeah, all the paint. <laughs> and I'm thinking, gee, how's she going to do that in a couple of hours? Wow. And mm. yeah, that's not how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, Anne kept in touch and was very interested in that we continued our fight. And she met the other ladies. Barbara's here with us too. She's one of the mm -hmm. girls in the boat. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. our escape boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and Anne, Anne has been great to all of us and stuck with us right through all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it was very, I was very put back at first at how passionate Anne was when I first met her about the issue mm -hmm. of children being displaced into the adult mental health institutions. Right. 
And I thought, this lady must have some connection because I've met a lot of people and quite often, um, maybe out of every 20, 30 people, I'll meet somebody whose mother was there or a family member or they know somebody. Lots of people are connected to the mental health system, not just the people who are living it. There's so many more people. Even people out in the country, they, you know, they've approached me and said, oh, my auntie was in there and when she came back she wasn't ever the same. Mm. And, and they remember that like 50 years later. Mm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was totally untainted. Mm. But hopefully with all the work we've done, I think the one thing that I would love more is no disabled children ever to be placed into any adult mental, mentally, not even a, a nursing home. Yeah. If we could have the resources to put so that, you know, disabled young people aren't put into nursing homes or any institution, because once you put a person into an institution, their mindset changes, their behaviour changes, and then you say, okay, you're out of there now, you're in society. <laughs> well, I'm 54 and I got out when I was in 1988 when I escaped and I still feel like I don't fit outside of an institution. And if I'm triggered enough, I be, my behaviour resorts back to that institutional behaviour, which I've always got to be aware of. Mm. So maybe early intervention would just be not doing it at all. Mm. And that's all I've got to say today. <laughs> well, yeah. well, quite an incredibly powerful story. Um, Thank you, Sue, and I think we're, we're probably we're not finished that story yet. But let's bring Anne in. So, how did you Anne meet mm. Sue and and start? Because I said at the beginning, this, this these works are not part of your normal kind of the mm. way in which your your pr painting practice goes, does it? Well, um, I certainly stepped outside of my usual regime of making work to show in a gallery and all of that kind of thing, to actually do something that I, I kind of hoped might make a, a change of some kind, you know. Um, it, it turned out, it turned into quite a long process, because I think I very naively thought, um, I mean, when I first heard Sue on the radio, yes, it was just this, it, I was very affected by, by what she said, and I just thought, how come we don't know about this? How, why is it that people aren't, why is this still, you know, and it was in such recent time. And uh, I just felt, I felt so privileged having had a, a very happy, um, you know, childhood loving parents. I um, was given all of those advantages and just, and I'm only five years younger than you. And I, um, I just, I just thought, I, you know, oh God, you know, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. Why don't I? Um, I had that sort of brainwave of trying to paint Sue, get it, out, get it out there, try to do the best, best possible work. So, so it's a, yeah, it's the first time that my work has had that kind of other dimension, um, and for that reason, it's it occupies a very special place. It's it's uh, much more important, I think, than than my other work. Um, but I'll just show you a few images if I could. Uh, um, my interest in in Walston Park kind of predates Sue, meeting Sue, because uh, when I was, uh, I think I, I'd been a mum for about a year and I realised that I was not coping terribly well, I wasn't feeling <laughs> competent or, you know, my work, I just felt I wasn't cut out for this and I was feeling like it was very hard to get out of bed every day. So my very nice GP suggested that I was depressed and um, of course that was, that was true and I realised that had I been born earlier, um, before the age of, of when things like this were known about, I might have ended up at Walston Park because a lot of people with postnatal depress depression um, who were not treated, they, they ended up there. And, I mean, but a lot of people, and um, the history of the place is very, it's very um, disturbing to read. And uh, I, I spent time looking at it and reading about it. This is the old part of the asylum. It's not where, where Sue and um, and the other and others were it this is the old women's ward so i found myself some sort of driving out to walston park and looking at it it's such a mournful place it's so it's if you have any illusions about asylums being exciting places and a lot of it there's a sort of kind of tourism that has mm. um, people people want to go they want to get photographed there they think they're going to see ghosts and it's all very you know everyone go and have YouTube. a fun time yeah that's a main, um, some very disturbing stuff on there but it's not like that at all it's actually it's a quiet sad place that it, it 
I mean, at its, in its heyday, there were 5,000 people living there. Um, now it's, it's still in existence, but it's very different. Um, I had a friend called Lydia who um, knew, the, knew the, the chief psychiatrist there, and she, uh, Terry Stedman, she knew I was interested in it, and she, allowed, she took me there for a sort of legitimate tour where we were allowed to, to go around it. And, uh, and I, I was really... What, what um, sort of struck me was how far away from everywhere it is and how in the old days people used to be sent there on the river. There was a boat where um, people would, would just be put there and then they'd find themselves going up the river and then they'd be alighting here. Um, uh, and uh, I tried to find where exactly they... I was kind of became obsessed with where, where was the sort of jetty and stuff. But, it, there's a um, Woogaroo Creek is it, that's Lydia there. We were trying to find any evidence of the landing. Anyway, so this is of course this is before. Okay, yeah, this is an old refidex from the year before I was born. And uh, if you look at it, you see there are so many kind of euphemistic names for the place: special hospital. Um, and there it is there. Um, and that's the, the, what they call the hospital reach of the river. Um, and it's out there with all of the sort of, you know, the, people don't know about it. Um, and that's, I mean, people ended up being put out there at, very recently um, when I listened to Sue on the radio. See, in my researches, I came across this exhibition that had taken place at the Museum of Brisbane. I just could scroll through these images yeah, of, of it as it is now. Um, anyway, sorry, it's a lot of photos. Um, oh, here we go, sorry about this, it's just, I wanted to, yeah, this, um, this exhibition which was on at the Museum of Brisbane. Yes. Yeah, which you obviously were yep. involved in and went to and, um, and there's a podcast that you can still listen to which is Sue on the radio talking about it with a couple of other people. ABC National Radio. That, that's right. And Natasha uh, Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, All in the Mind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one of the psychiatrists who works there now... Dr White. Yeah, he was there. And he, he was very scathing about it. Um, and, but, but when Sue came to talk about it, you know, what struck me was just how... Um, just how you, you were able to express what had happened, you know, in your life. And you, you, you spoke about it so kind of passionately and also with a lot of, with, with so much um, compassion for your fellow, the, the, yeah. the other people who were there, the other kids. Um, but you weren't like super angry either, which really surprised me because um, you'd, you'd been placed there without any reason to be there beyond the circumstances in, into which you were born. And, you know, I know a little bit now a bit more about how children, children become vulnerable and that their behaviour, it says something about their environment. It's not that they're intrinsically bad or mad. It's just that they, they're not being given the right sort of context to be, to be happy in. And, um, and when you spoke about uh, your having had a, a child and, and uh, when you were 18, I think, was yes, it? I was 19 when he yeah. when he was born. Okay, and that they that they told you like they didn't protect you from the situation where you would get pregnant, no. but they told you while you were pregnant that you weren't allowed to be a mother or that you wouldn't yeah, be a good mother. Wouldn't be able to be a mother. Yeah, and um and they took your child away as soon as he was born. And I just I must say I cried <laughs> when I heard this, you know, mm. because it was just so so just a, such a, a traumatic story. And to think that this was going on, like when I was having my very lovely uh, childhood, and it was geographically, the, there's Osler House, you know. Um, yep. I don't know if it's still there. I'll just yes, pass on over it that is. one. The police have taken it over, people. <laughs> How's that? Okay. It's now a training area or something. Yeah. And so they reckon there's ghosts. The police reckon they there's do. ghosts. Oh, they, they do. Running they Running scared, are they? They do. Um, I've heard stories. Uh, <laughs> so I, I decided to, to do something. <laughs> I, I wanted to meet you and, and I, I gathered up the... I don't know how I got your number, but anyway, I, I called I think you, you got it from um, Natasha Mitchell because oh. she contacted me and said that... Oh, OK. ...asked me if it was yeah. OK if you got yep. my number. And I must say, that took a bit of courage on my behalf because I'm not the kind of person who just, you know, bails people up. But I, and, and then you said, yeah, come down and meet me. And so I drove down in my Camry to um, Crestmead, where you were living. And um, 
yeah, I was pretty nervous because I thought, really? yeah, but but you were so that it was great. We went in. You had two very big dogs, though. That was yeah. a bit scary. <laughs> Charlie and Nala. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you were living in the underground part of a yeah. house. That was when it was. It, you know, you talk about the institutional yeah. institutionalization. I noticed that your bed was in the middle of a, a space with just like yeah. curtains and sheets and tablecloths hanging around, not walls, no, no. doors, because no. you said you didn't like. I still can't do that. Yeah. And um, so I sat on the edge of your, your bed and we, we chatted. In my lounge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My whole family used to all sit on that bed and half the time the kids would fall asleep and there'd be like eight of us on the bed falling asleep. <laughs> it was very nice. Um, and we took, we, we, I thought we got on very well. And, yeah, we did. And then we went outside and I took some photos of you. Because you were nothing like I thought an artist would be. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You'd, yeah. left, you'd left your beret behind. No, oh, you know, yeah. all the colourful clothes, like the super colourful clothes. and. Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, yeah, we've got a few artists here today, haven't we? <laughs> and so, uh, look, just to put it in perspective, that was where I grew up, up there in Kenmore, and that is yeah. where you were. Um, anyway, so there you are. Yeah, there I am. Yep. <laughs> uh, I tried to find that shirt too. To, to wear today? Yeah, because I was going to oh. stand beside the painting and see if anyone recognised me. <laughs> Then they would have seen that I didn't do the flowers properly. That would have, I'm glad you didn't. I didn't like the flowers on that shirt. Oh, anyway, so, okay. There's the uh, possum. Yes, there's a possum. There's my, my, my son asked me to add Yeah, I love this part of the story. And the bug, and my daughter asked me to put in the butterfly, and there's a spider up there. But yeah. so Your kids got very interested in it, didn't they? They, they did, and then my son got very angry and annoyed that I was spending so much time on the painting, and he, he threw something at it, and that was when I knew, okay, stop, I'll, I'll, it's ready now. Um, uh, there you go, there's oh, your daughters. Yeah, uh, coming to see it, right? And Cindy. <laughs> yes, you haven't changed. <laughs> and then, okay, so getting it ready. I was, I was very hyped, I thought, this is great, I'm going to win the Archibald, I'm going to get the money, I'm going to give it to Sue, she can hire a lawyer, anyway. And this is also uh, wrapping it up when I didn't have the right kind of stuff, so I'm using it's Glad huge. Bake. It's and uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I realised also you can't stick anything to Glad Bake, so I did, oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Sent it down to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, um, and then I heard that it not only did it not win, but it wasn't even selected. And that was a blow, because I mean, in my, I suppose, arrogance, I thought, this, there's no way I'm not going to get hung. I, I'd actually won the Sulman Prize once, so I thought, you know, that's, I'm, I'm a shoe in But, and then, this is one of the paintings that did get, it, it won the Packing Room Prize of that year. And no disrespect to Tara Moss, that's a picture of her, because she's an activist in her own right and a feminist, um, but, hello. <laughs> uh, I mean... <laughs> And the winner that year was actually um, uh, Del Catherine Barton, so it was a, it was a, it was a deserving uh, winner. However, I just felt really bad when I had to ring Sue up and say, um, no. <laughs> guess what, yeah, sorry, didn't get in. Um, but so then she invited me to come along to the apology. Do you want to say what that was? Uh, that was that, that was in 2000 and... In Canberra or here? No, here. Here. Yeah. That's the, was the forced adoptions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, where? When what, they lost it. That, Remember they what lost... What was that guy's name, that um, Premier? Oh, God, Campbell Newman. Campbell Newman. Mm. That's when... He, oh, he's so unforgettable, isn't he? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Um, that's when he, he apologised <coughs> on behalf of um, Queensland for the forced adoptions of children, like, mm. over, what, what, 30, 40 years or longer. Yeah. And then I noticed that our painting, <coughs> our apology for the kids who were placed, misplaced into the adult mental institutions, it was missing, yet it was promised that it was going to be there forever. And I um, approached one of the staff and I asked where it was. And then on the Sunday, I'd already contacted the um, Brisbane Times and they came and did a story about it. So by, by Sunday, it was in the newspaper. Um, Monday, I got a call from Parliament. They were really happy that I'd... Mm. You know, to thank them for the, you know for looking, and Fiona Simpson, mm. the Speaker of the House, got on our side, and the whole of Parliament. Which I, up until that point, I thought that Parliament and the government were all one. Whoever was in mm. power, they were the boss of Parliament. But that's not true. <laughs> it's the People's Parliament, and th so they demanded that the apology be returned by I think it was ten o'clock Tuesday morning, and then I was in there, and we had a we also had to get it put into uh, Hansard because otherwise it won't be recorded forever. And so Fiona Simpson made sure that happened. There was um, Tracy Davis from the Department of Communities. She was 
she was very actively trying to make it all happen as well. We had a lot of supporters, but just not one person could do anything on their own. Yeah. And then you know the government, if you've got to put one... That apology took so many years to obtain because every time they changed one little bit, it could have been um, A instead of is or something. Something that to me seemed minute and nothing. It had to go back all the way around again. It took another year. Mm, yeah. I, I don't know how they get things done. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's but what they it don't. got done. And, yeah. um, but unfortunately, a lot of people who had fought, you know, probably harder than I even fought, I fought as well, from the start, they didn't get to make it. They didn't see the end of it. Mm. So mostly the reconciliation was about remembering those people that didn't make it as well. And that when I went to that event, that's when I realised, you know, how many people had been involved mm. behind the scenes, like Wally Deathless. I mean, you can read a lot about people online and find out what, what they've done and, yeah, about MICA projects and all these people who don't get any kind of um, public acknowledgement, really, but uh, mm. just because they're decent people have been fighting with Sue and, mm. and the others, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, just uh, when we you... started, there was 53 at the first meeting in 99 that we had, where we all got together. And out of that 53, and there a few new, you know, newer people, there was nine of us left mm. to see reconciliation. Yeah. And we were just one handful of the survivors at that time. So. Mm. Before you leave that slide, just can you go back to your painting? Yeah. Oh, there because there's quite, a, there's quite a lot in that so in that image yeah. and it'd be great to just get a so there's a you know there's a snake in the corner yeah. there's two a set, <laughs> yeah. there's two sets of you know uh, exotic species plants that are very obvious and mm. I'll get you to unpack that and you've got Sue outside the facility mm. as if she's not running away but it just can you just unpack yeah. it for us a bit um, please yeah, I mean, I had to put a lot of thought in how I was going to represent Sue because it's a huge, um, what's the word, responsibility painting someone, not only getting them right, looking right, but but how you depict them, you know? I mean, it's it's a very vexed thing and a lot of people would say you can't really do it or if you do it, you're doing it for the wrong reasons and I had to look at myself and ask myself, why am I doing this? You know, is it because I want the attention myself? Is it some, I mean, artists do that anyway, in a way, like that's what they put their work out there. That's but this great. time it was different. Um, I did think very carefully. I mean, that that is still the old Walston. It's not where you were, but See other those than those white buildings yes, there? That's They're, They were the new ones in the 80s. Was it Noble House? Yeah, you, no, uh, yeah. there's McDonald House, um, A and B, then there's, Oh no, because back further there's like, mm. I think it's Anderson House? No, yeah. no, that's... Anyway, that's the one that you're looking at there, that's McDonald House. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, um, anyway, it's, I wanted it to almost be... It's, it's a bit like a sort of an old-fashioned kind of painting where people were depicted in the landscape, you know, usually in the landscape that they owned um, with a beautiful kind of park and garden and their house in the background, that kind of thing. That's what... That's the kind of painting I'm referring to. But, mm. yeah, I decided um, Sue, once she escaped from Walston Park, you know, she yeah, proved lived, herself yeah. to be so strong and survived. Went, lived in the bush. <laughs> lived in, yeah, in the bush in the with wetlands. no... Hadn't, yeah. Having had no kind of... Um, no, no one prepared you for that, no. but you just somehow survived that. I mean, I would have not survived a night, I think. So, And that's why I've depicted you in Trial there with the... <laughs> Angels' trumpets around you, yeah. um, which are, are very poisonous. Um, I remember my mum warning me about them when I was a kid because, you know, th they're so beautiful and children will often try and take parts of a plant and, you know, if they eat them, they'll, that's terrible. But, of course, mm. you can boil them up and they create another really sort bad. of experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then on the right-hand side, I've got this, these amazing exotic plants from the, um, the sausage tree. I don't know the proper name which flower in a park near where I was living in Tawong, um, which Simon knows very well. And what struck me about those is that they're flowers which are certainly not like your pretty um, cottage, you know, your English roses and things like that, but they're amazing. And, um, and, and I guess in a, in a way, I'm the thing that also shocked me about women girls who ended up at Walston Park. There was, were men also. Yeah, there were. There yeah. were, absolutely. Um, but in a way, that's it, 
Yeah. Mm. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I feel bad about that because no, I, I, you right. can't paint everybody. But That's and right. also, the thing about the women is, I think in particular was. Uh, Girls who behaved in a certain way, I think, were, were, have uh, still are judged in a particular way by society. Yes. You know, um, may become promiscuous was a common term. Right, well, uncontrollable there. and yeah, delinquent, yeah, as you say. Yeah, 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 yeah. The promiscuity, the judgment that goes on, whereas blokes are actually boys are expected to kind of. They'd be, be transferred from some of the children's um, disability homes mm. to Walsham Park. May become, may mm. become promiscuous or something. Mm. Yeah. Maybe there was a little girl, autistic girl, she was only 12. Yeah, yeah. And no way should she have ever been there. No, that's, uh, that's But you can't put people with criminally insane men that are there for rape and murder and whatever and expect the mm. the, the young girls or the children to be safe. No. That's, um, yeah, that's always been my um it's not there's no logic in it. Mm. I think it was just the culture of the day out of sight out of mind. But also, like, even in, as recent in the 80s, you, you, if you were gay, you know, oh, if yes, you were a lesbian, yes. you could be sent to Walston Park. Yeah, I remember the first yeah. time um, a, a young fella came to Piers House and he was the first AIDS victim. Mm. And the way he was treated... Mm. Now, we're in a ward away and we're all eating with, now eating with pl um, plastic plates, knives and forks. And he was not allowed to sit at a table with another person. Oh, my God. He... Mm. Um, mm. They even the nursing staff at that t and at that time, and that's in the, probably the um, mid eighties. He was so ignorant about AIDS that yeah. that poor man he was mm. persecuted. He couldn't be put into a semi-open ward. He wasn't allowed to go for walks around the grounds. Um, and terrible. if he ever hurt himself, he was just left to suffer until somebody got there with all the gloves and mm. and everything. There mm. was no no educating people. Mm. at the time mm -hmm. and I often wonder what happened to him because he, he was treated so badly. Yeah so you you had that instinct to care about the others that mm. you know the vulnerable other kids that you saw there and that really struck me as well I mean you were, you were suffering enough yourself but you also noticed those kids and you remembered them and wanted to do something for mm. them. I think mm. the children's homes also um, had buffered me a little bit for that mm -hmm. is because in the children's homes there was always you know that one that was a little bit tougher that looked after the little ones and and also a maternal person, though. So yeah, you're I think I'm very maternal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I pick up puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Uh, and ju just, well, it's, I'm sure you want to move on, but, Sue, in this picture, and you look at your wrist or your hand... Oh, yeah. ..and Scars. there's scarring. Yes. Yes, I, I, um, I wasn't a self-harmer before I went to Lowson House, but then I, I started to harm myself. And I, it was more out of rage. It was, not, was never to kill myself. Um, and in a way, in a sick sort of way, at 13, it was like I can hurt myself more than you can hurt me. Mm. And that became a habit to where it became a more of a release and I'd feel good after I'd done it. But then when I started having kids or, you know, close to having kids, I had to stop all of that because I couldn't pass that understanding of life over onto my kids So because mm. then they would grow up and they would do the same thing, which I've seen with many families. Mm. So um, it just made me stronger wanting to be a mother. Yeah. Because I wanted to prepare myself for if I ever did get the chance to find my son. And so I wanted to be in a better life and a better, um, I don't know, just a better person when I did find him. So, yeah, and then I found him. That was pretty cool. Good on you. And it's, it's, a, it's a story that's hard for me to Private absorb. investigator donated his time oh. and tracked him down for me. Really? Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Extraordinary. Only took him two weeks. <laughs> He's probably in the phone book. <laughs> Karen, Karen Walsh um, from Micah, she's actually walked every step of this road with me. Wow. Mm. And there's Mark there. He's always been... Mm. And Jenny. But, um, no, Karen has been pretty good to me. And mm. Father Wally. Mm. My two... Yeah, Father Wally still looks after me, hey. <laughs> and he's a retired... Sorry, Father Wally. He's a retired priest who never retired... Okay, and they just come together all at the right time. Um, I actually was a bit disgusted with the apology because I, I noted that it, was, it, it took place in this area at Parliament House. Uh, no, was this the apology or was this when they, oh, when they, when re they rehung? Yeah, they rehung. Yeah, so they didn't apologise. Sorry, they didn't apologise uh, again. Okay, that's what, it yeah. was just for the... Refinding um, the document and yeah, putting it back. And yeah, yeah. 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 But we, uh, had to, we had to do it on um, a day that Parliament was sitting. Ah, uh, OK. Because we needed it to be recorded in Hansard. Oh, yeah. That's so, yeah, everybody was busy upstairs talking government stuff. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, and they mentioned it took about five seconds. Yes. 
Um, oh, that's a book. Um, there's another uh, person in Canberra called Adele Chenoweth, Chenoweth who has recorded a lot of the testimony of kids who've been in homes. I mean, that's a huge project and she's devoted herself to that. Yeah. Um, I think one thing, one of the things that shocked me also was the fact that you and, and some of the other girls would have been um, experimented on with, yeah. with drugs. That's, used a, to that's actually, a, that looks like a peraldehyde needle. Yeah, yeah. Um, they had to make, use a glass because it melted plastic. Oh, they got that wrong, okay. Right. Um, there's Barbara. So when I went to the apology, I, I asked if I could, if I could page gorgeous. them. <laughs> Um, I asked if I could photograph some of the women that Sue knew there and um, whoever was, was sort of willing, I, I photographed them and I um, painted them. That's Angela and that's Nell. That's and Nelly. So Nell's no longer with us. No. Um, I've, do I've donated those paintings in her memory, right? Cause, yeah. And um, sadly, I don't even know who to contact about her, who her family well, is. Well, Nellie Bliss, her, her sister mm. is Edith Bliss. Who's Edith Bliss? She was a big time singer. Does anyone remember Edith Bliss? Big oh. time singer. Okay, I'll have to Google her, YouTube. Yeah, okay. But she was famous. Yeah. <laughs> just, just sing us a few songs. Yeah. You know? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, Edith Bliss, look her up. She was a um, singer songwriter back in the 70s. Okay. And that's Nellie Bliss's sister. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So. But sadly, Nellie was um, let down by the system in the end. Yeah. She, because the um, public trust would only afford her a certain amount out of her pension for personal care. Oh, right. Yep. So she, even though she um, very much needed a, a shower every day, she was afforded a shower once a week. In Brisbane, in the heat. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, shock. And because she had a lot of problems, she was in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And because it cost $7.50 <laughs> um, per time, and that's all, like, the, the non-government services, been, they, they yeah. subsidise the rest. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, or whoever does, I don't know, she had to pay $7.50, but they would not afford her. She gave up cigarettes and everything. Mm. They would not afford her the uh, more than one shower a week. And I thought that was absolutely disgusting. Yeah. yeah. She was also such a positive person. When I spoke yeah. to her on the phone, she was saying, oh, I'm really looking forward to seeing yeah, you. And, yeah. and, then I, and, then I, and then her sister rang me after she died because she found my name in her contact. Yeah. Um, and that's Patty. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, Patty. So, and Rhonda. Rhonda. So. Gee, she looks young. You made her look younger than me. Where's all uh, her wrinkles? <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. No, no. Uh, and um, anyway, so the, as Simon said earlier, the, the, the smaller painting, which is outside, which has got um, the, some women in a boat, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to have one more last crack at painting this and sort of getting it somewhere where people can see it. So I thought I'd, I'd go back and I, that's where I stood on, um, I have my very good friends, Ali and James, who live out at Mogul. I used to drive out and visit them and I noticed that at the end of Pryor, uh, Pryor's Pocket Road is a vantage point that you can see Walston Park opposite. Um, and uh, so I went out there, it's very, uh, that side of the river is, is very jungly um, yeah. and I did some sketches. There was a, a graveyard over there that Ron, uh, Rhonda yes, found. I, yeah. I've seen that on YouTube. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, it's just such an eerie place. It's still, and there are things that have been discarded. This is this is over on the um, on the side of the river where Walston is, yeah. and you see these objects and and things, and you think, well, what you know, what's the past? How did that end up there? There was this mattress. Someone had obviously been sleeping rough there, um, and um, and so yeah. So then I began the process uh, in my in my uh, studio in Brisbane of doing the painting and um, the difficult bit was doing the faces because they're so tiny, they're like the size of a thumbprint <laughs> and it just took, you know, one... Very small brush. Very tiny brush and, and one wrong brush stroke just destroys the, the, the face. So it was really, I agonised so over well. that. <laughs> so we have Sue. I can, tell, I can tell who all... Oh, yeah, yeah. That's them. That's my imaginary uh, image of, of the survivors in a boat, you know, kind of halfway between. Oh. <laughs> and this is, this is funny. Um, not, not funny, but I also wanted to put their names somehow in the picture, but I, uh, it's such a tricky thing. Again, that thing of representing someone and, you know, it, it's, it's, you feel like you're really overstepping sometimes. And um, I wanted to have a little clue in there as to who everyone was, like put their initials yeah. in there. 
but I decided not to do it in... Uh, when I was a kid, I read this great book by Lucy Boston, which is The Children of Green Know, and there's a, uh, a, a, a depiction of this ancient language. It's not, not ancient, but it's uh, Wicca. It's, it's um, the witch's alphabet, they call it. And fortunately for me, um, I decided I'd use that as the sort of as the the language. Um, and I have a friend, Julie, whose book is that, and I'm featured on the cover of her book. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, she was able to help me to uh, translate a bit of text. And I've scratched it into that tree trunk on the left there. And then I've got all of the um, the initials of the women who are in the boat. And just, just going yeah. back, Anne, that, mm. so the vantage point is looking towards... Walston. Uh, but yeah. you can but You, you can just, just a... see it. There's a, there's a chimney, the smokestack, um, which is sort of behind and, the trees. Oh, yeah, I see it. And then so I've, I've got a lot of sort of little, I guess, you know, there is symbolism in the, the pathway that's blocked by those kind of spiky weeds and there's a, yeah. there's a snake with an egg. The thing that struck me about this whole thing was that the state, was, which meant you were wards of the yes. state, but the state did not provide with the most basic, you know, things like an education, the ability to, you know, you were just deprived of things that everyone else takes mm. for granted. So anyway, um, and I've uh, just uh, Simon earlier was saying my work, it's different. I think, I think, um, I don't know whether it is that different from the rest of my work. I mean, I've always concentrated on things that are not, are not pretty, you know. I mean, I like painting things that are politically motivated, but maybe they're wrapped up a bit to look more palatable because it's a way of getting things out so kind of surreptitiously. Um, this, for example, is um, when I grew up in Kenmore, I used to go on the bus as a kid past the Salvation Army home called Alkira, which was on Mogul Road. And, um, and then in the, in the course of reading about Sue and, and Walston, uh, the, the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Abuse, I read that Alkira had been the site of some terrible stuff that went on, you know, um, for the boys that were that lived there in the 70s. So while I was driving past, terrible stuff was happening. Um, and oh, there we are. That's me. And when I was a member of a cult, no, um, <laughs> oh, the just say no. Goody two shoes. I know, but um, yeah, my best friend was a Baptist, and so uh, yeah, from that to that, um, you know, I think. I kind of saw it as my mission, and not, not my mission, but I, you can't help but see this stuff. And, uh, um, and then I suppose that's a portrait of my two children there on the edge oh. of that. Um, and I've named that after Boo Radley, the, the character in To Kill a Mockingbird, um, who, of course, in that book is, when you read that book, if you know anything about autism, you know that Boo Radley was autistic. It's not stated. He was just the weird kid who lived in a house and no one really, so he didn't speak and, and yet he made these little carved figures for the Scout and Jem, the, the characters in that book, um, and he was actually really kind. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, you go around and you see houses and you see things that are falling apart, you know, and I think you said once, Sue, when you see people who are struggling, most, I mean, a lot of us, we, we just do look away. Mm. But when you, ha I don't know, it's when you see a, a, it's the, the, the scenario where someone has got a kid and the kid is screaming in a supermarket and people just like hurry away, you shouldn't do that. You should, you know, you Engage. should Give to say smile. something. Yes. It doesn't take much to smile. And sometimes it can brighten up a person's day. Yeah, yeah, I think. Because anyway. they're so used to nowadays, everybody just ignores everybody. That's right. But Everyone's if you make contact, eye contact with somebody, you at least offer a smile. Mm. So, 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 so these are my other pictures, which I think, um, you know, they kind of do relate a bit to what I've been doing, you know, with, with my other, uh, with, with the work that I did. About, so in other words, the work that I did um, about Sue and about Walston and the survivors of Walston Park, I think it, it has um, in, informed everything else that I'm doing. So, yeah. You're a great artist. Oh, thank you. No, not true, but, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't draw a straight a line. <laughs> <laughs> well, nor can Anne. I mean. Oh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> thank you so much. I'll oh, just ending with this great image from um, oh. this fabulous movie called The Night of the Hunter, which is, I think it's Lillian Gish, and her character is, she's looking out for these kids um, who are being hunted by Robert Mitchum's character, and I just love that image of her with a rifle. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>